Hello everyone. Today we're going to be talking about some tips for performing endodontic surgery. I gave this lecture to the SLU residents last week and unfortunately the first few slides cut out. So I'm going to re-record those here and then you'll see the rest of the procedure. So when you're doing surgery, one of the most important things is making sure that both you and the staff feel comfortable for the procedure so that the patient does as well. So there are a few things that you want to do even before the patient arrives. I like to use a pre-made kit. I'll show you which one I use in just a little bit here, but I don't know half the names of the instruments inside there, but it's really nice because someone else has already thought of exactly what you're going to need to do the procedure. Like I said, it's going to have everything you need. I have multiple spoons. I don't know which that the names are of them. I just say little spoon, medium spoon, big spoon, and thankfully my staff knows which one to hand me. One of the big important things is to make sure you talk through the case with assistants, especially if they have not done this procedure before. You know, they do root canals all day long, but the surgery aspect, there's blood, there's sutures, there's not, you know, 15 blades all over the place. So <laughs> you want to make sure they feel very comfortable. And I like to actually go through and make them write down, you know, the step one, we're going to give anesthesia. Step two, we'll lay a flap, et cetera, and kind of go through that process. The other thing is you're going to need to have six-handed dentistry for this. It's very important to have really good isolation when you do the retrofill. And so you're going to need to have a second person in the room with you. It's good to make sure you prepare them for that as well so they know what to expect. One big thing is to make sure if they've never seen one of these before that they have eaten before you start treatment. I've had multiple patients had to leave or multiple uh, staff members have to leave during the procedure because they felt uncomfortable and started to get um, a little woozy for it. <laughs> so you definitely want to make sure that they've had food, that they're not locking their knees because you don't want to have to deal with both a patient with a, you know, open area as well as one of your staff members passed out on the floor. And even if they've done it before and they've been in the endo for a long time, if they're not used to surgery and not used to blood, they can have that vasovagal reflex and kind of pass out. So you want to be careful about that. Also, you want to make sure that you have extra time in here. Make sure you have extra supplies in the room. You don't want to have side books. The key thing here is you do not want to have to leave the room for any reason whatsoever. Uh, with a root canal, it's not as big of a deal if you kind of leave them in there and need to go grab something. I still don't like doing that. But for a surgery, there's bleeding. You want to minimize the time that you are in there to as little as possible. So this is the kit that I like. This is the kit that I use. Um, it's from BNL. I got the titanium one because it's lighter, so it's easier on your hand. Um, it is pricey, unfortunately. However, it works fantastic. It has sutures. It has retro mirrors and what you can do is add in extra items as well so i added in a couple different mirrors um, i like my locking forceps so we have those in there a couple different things for sutures so you do not have to keep it to just this kit you can customize it to be you know exactly what you want so this is our kit so starting from the left um, i like to have two different syringes here i'm going to use the 1 to 50 epi that seems to work really well for hemostasis you do get some bleeding after but by then you should be closed up all the way. I just use a 15 blade. Um, I was trained by oral surgeons and I know there are tons of fancy different ones you can use. I'd like to keep it simple. 15 blade is all that you need. You can see there's a couple different instruments in here too. I have a double-sided just regular mirror for, you know, re this is actually for retraction. It's a size four or five. And then I still have my size zero just in case I need that for any reason. The rest of this is the kit as normal. A um, few other things here. I love Minnesotas. So we have two of those. Once again, trained by oral surgeons. So very familiar with Minnesotas. Tissue retractors are a nice little addition as well. This is the Mirror Magic from Zerk. And I like to coat all of my really tiny mirrors as well as any mirror that I have in this. It creates a really nice hydrophobic um, surface and helps fill in any scratches of the mirror so you're not constantly wiping it as much and makes for photography makes for, uh, photos a lot easier um, good to have a couple cotton pellets and then i like to use racelets i'll talk about those a little bit later in the presentation um, great idea to have uh, locking forceps in here as well i have a couple different options um, in here just because locking forceps are just very useful lots and lots of gauze because the patient bites down on the gauze for the actual procedure that way you have a little more flexibility in the lips to stretch them out i use bc putty for all my retrofills it works fantastically well uh, see patient goggles and then good old sutures so um i use 5-0 vicryl i absolutely hate chromic gut i think it's the worst thing ever made in the world <laughs> uh you can use 6-0 but five seems to be the best most of my patients are a little uh 
rougher on the flap itself with the strong muscles. So I need, I like the five. I've, I've used six in the past, but it definitely tends to pull out a little bit more. And I think we're going to cut here and I'll go right into the presentation where I left it off with the students. Okay, so this is the surgery setup. Um, I literally just got done doing one. Do you guys have any questions about the surgery setup or anything? I know we talked about it last time, but this is yeah this is how my side looks um the tips we have over here i have a bunch of different ones from a few different companies when you're out and buying your own stuff let me know and i'll give you the advice of which ones i like and then the only setup you need is that area impact 45 on the actual handpiece itself so pretty straightforward setup um, this is where i like having two ultrasonics because i use multiple ultrasonic tips for the surgery so kind of useful for that um i have a bunch of different ones so Pretty much you want to run them usually at 75% or lower. Um, they have different angles that you can go into. There's diamond coated, there's carbide coated, there's new ones from, the, I just found like four new ones that I want at the AE. So this is one of those where just kind of figure out what you like and get a big variety of them. Um, so this is a cool one that I've been using now. It's called the Blade Sonic and it works by using ultrasonics to cut the tip off the root. It works fantastically well. Really love this one. And then you can get, these are the Kispers or Kisp, uh, tips from Buchanan, um, different angles, different lengths. So there's all sorts of different options you can use on what you like. These are some of my favorite. These are from BNL. And they have a couple you can bend yourself, which is pretty cool. That's this very last one over here. But what's neat about these is instead of using diamonds, they actually put like little cuts in there. So it's almost serrated. So it pulls gutta percha out really nicely. So highly recommend that one as well. Um, far as what we got else going on, we talked about needing the Air Impact 45. Um, it's expensive, just buy one. They, they work. Um, I use a couple different options. There is an electric one, which is pretty badass, but it's very expensive. And I will probably get one of those after my Air one finally breaks. The, you'll need a couple different round carbides, do them in surgical length, and then you'll need the Lindemann burr, which is designed to cut both bone and tooth structure. And that's just kind of your general kit that what you're going to need. You don't want to use diamonds because they create too much debris and you, it's tough to get that cleaned out. So you want to just use carbides when you're doing surgeries. As far as pre-op stuff, what you want to do, we always want to consult first. We want to sedate pretty much everyone. Um, I use Halcyon for all of them. I just did it on a 70 year old and used Halcyon. He was fantastic. So we usually want to start antibiotics about three days beforehand that take that gets it up to a high enough level in the bloodstream that they're not going to be an issue when you're actually working on them. And then I like to use a pre op chlorhexidine rinse just to knock down the level of bacteria inside the mouth. You want to be the first patient of the day because it does take your staff longer to set up so that way they're not worried about it. You want to set up everything beforehand so you don't you, the last thing you want to do is have to get up and leave or have to set up stuff while the patient's you know open you want to not have to do that at all plan out the surgery using the cone beam before i go in there i'm you know moving everything around and looking at what i have to do how much space i have how far down i have to go gives you a better idea Pr figure out if you have to do a frenulplasty we'll talk about that at the end and then talk about any complications so the sinus if there's nerves things like that because the staff are going to be usually a little more anxious about this anyway so you want to make sure there's no reason for them to be stressed as well and make sure once again do not have any reason to leave the room at all so as far as the treatment itself i like to use the 150 epi this works really well inject it until it's all blanched i'll have photos of this in a second i like to use the attached gingival flaps so cut right at where the attached gingival level is it makes suturing way easier sometimes you do have to full thickness but then the sutures are a little more complicated and you run the risk of recession so not a great option there um, i like to have a pillow available so they can turn their head if we're working on say like a premolar i want to have direct vision and i don't really want to use the mirror for anything except looking at the retro preparation so having the pillow and having them turn their head is far easier than trying to use indirect vision for that sort of thing I like to have them bite down on gauze as well uh, a lot of times they're going to try to open that's going to stretch out their lips and make it a lot harder to retract and then take lots of pictures. We'll show you those. So this is what it looks like when it's blanching. You can see I like to give, I usually give about half of the cartridge along where I'm going to be making my cuts. And then I give the final half over the injections or the, over the space where the uh, lesion is located. So that's kind of what it looks like when it's all nice and blanched. A couple tips with the scalpel. You don't want to go in perpendicular to the, uh, to the tissue. You actually want to come in at a 45 degree angle. That gives you a larger flap to kind of re- approximate it more effectively and so instead of coming in like this you want it to like that so cut it up so that it's angled towards the tooth structure towards the coronal aspect and that way when the flap comes back together there's more surface area to grab onto 
You want to make nice long cuts. I think you all know this. If you're in the anterior scallop and the posterior, it can be a straight line. And then I like using verticals, but you just want to use one. If you do two on either side, your morbidity increases quite a lot. As far as tips, you want to go about two millimeters apical to the lesion and then just put your Minnesota there and it just stays there until you're done. You do not want to push the Minnesota to the flap because it causes bruising. It can cause hemorrhage, a lot of nasty things. So when the assistants are holding the Minnesota, you want to make sure they're also not pushing it super hard into the flap as well. As far as removing it, you need to generally you'll have to remove a little bit of the bone to get in there and you can use either a round burr or the Lindemann burr for this. Use, I have like 10 different spoons and curettes and I just kind of say little one, medium one, big one. <laughs> just, they, I don't know the actual names from and that's totally fine. But you want to get as, you know, as much of it out and usually you're going to remove about the apical three millimeters, but you have to plan this out on the comb beam because sometimes you need to remove more, sometimes it's less, it, you don't have enough space, it kind of just depends. You guys know most of this. Sometimes you actually have to do the apicoectomy before you can even get the rest of the lesion out because there's so much behind it. So that's another complication. You do not have to do every root. So oftentimes on a premolar, I'll just do the buckle. I won't go through and do the palatal. On a molar, I'll just do the MB. I won't do the distal or the palatal. Don't ever do a palatal root surgery on a molar because that absolutely sucks. Um, as far as getting it all out, the studies say you don't have to remove all of it, but I like to. It just makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. And then as far as biopsying, if it looks funky, you can. If the patients worry, you can. But I did it for the first five years, and it came back the same every single time as a granuloma. I had one actinomycosis infection, and they said to give them amoxicillin, which they are already on. So I think it's an added expense. Uh, do not repeat this in front of the board, because they will say that you have to biopsy everything. <laughs> but as far as in private practice, you really don't have to. Okay. As far as the retroprep, sometimes you can't do it. Sometimes it's not needed. Um, I usually use uh, MT uh, BC for my obturation to seal that back up. Um, if there's a post inside there, you're also not going to be able to do it. So we talked a little bit about the retro prep, but in general, you need about three to four millimeters as far as your depth, but you can go deeper. There are some new ones that are about six millimeters deep, which are pretty cool. And there's tons of different options like we talked about for the ultrasonics. And then is everyone familiar with the retroplast option for filling? Anyone familiar with that? Nobody? Bueller? <laughs> A retroplast is instead of using um, either MTA or BC, you actually use flowable composite. So you etch prime bond the apical part of the root and then do a flowable composite over the top of it. I've had to do this twice and both of the times it was a post with resorption. So I couldn't get any, you know, actual prep to go into. So that's where the flowable works really well. How to prepare the crypt. A racelets work extremely well. They're just a little bit racemic epinephrine in a cotton pellet. There's two different sizes, actually three different sizes, I think. There's a bunch of different sizes. So have a few different options. We usually have about three out of each size. Make sure you count. Uh, you never want to leave anything inside the mouth, obviously. Um, and then what you can do is you actually push on the racelets while the assistant comes in and suctions. And that really helps to draw out all the blood and create a nice strong clot so you don't have to worry about any blood going inside the um, crypt while you're working. <coughs> Calcium sulfate, I don't like using it. I think it's messy. I know a lot of dentists used to use it. Um, I worked with one who loved it. I, I've never liked it, but it works well. You coat the whole thing and you can actually leave it in there and it will resorb over time. Uh, 1 to 50 epi can be used as well if you got some bleeding spots. There's a couple different options. Uh, if you're really close to the palatal tissue and you didn't give a palatal injection, oftentimes when you're removing the lesion itself, they're going to feel it. And so you need to actually inject into the palatal tissue as well. And then as far as do we need to stain the root, most of the time with our microscopes, I don't think it's necessary. I mean, here's a cracked one I had recently. I didn't need to stain it. It had already been stained with, you know, bacteria. So I don't really stain the root. I know a lot of people do. You can do it in residency, but I, I haven't found it useful i do it maybe one every 15 procedures and just use some blue dye stuff it's not a big deal so you can clearly see the i mean you don't need a dye to see that crack right yeah do you usually not give a palatal when you're doing surgery no unless unless it's a through and through if i if i see that it goes all the way through then i will give a palatal but most of the time it's not necessary because the the bones rock solid you're prescribing antibiotics for all your patients before surgeries yep Three days before. How far ahead of time? Three, oh, three days. days. Sorry. Yep. It takes 72 hours to get up to high enough levels in the bloodstream to become effective. And what that does, it just makes it so that if there's any bacteremias from your surgery itself, they're not going to have as many complications after. So I don't want them to be in pain. And so I like to do everything I can to minimize postoperative complications. So. 
All right, let's talk about the sinus, because every now and then you will have some teeth that get close to it. Really important to plan this out on the comb beam. You will be able to see if there is a line of bone. You'll be able to see if there's a perforation into the sinus. And sometimes you have to abort the surgery if it's going to be inside there. So really important to plan this out so you can see what you're going to do. I recommend using ultrasonics for this because just like piezos, they're not going to cut the sinus membrane unless you're really dumb and push into it. But if you just gently touch the sinus membrane with an ultrasonic, it's not going to actually break it. If you do it with a big old, you know, eight round burr, it's going to break your sinus membrane and then you're going to have a bad day. So I like to use ultrasonics for this and that's where all those cool, um, retro prep things that I showed you are very useful. You just be careful with air water. Don't blast it. <laughs> Don't have the you know, assistant go in there with a big old thing of air because you can cause you know, air into the sinus, which is weird. I like to use collar plugs if I'm close to the sinus. Um, it resorbs very easily and it just makes suturing a lot more comfortable for me because I know that I have a nice solid barrier on top of there. Um, you can cut them. Have you guys all used collar plugs before? Yeah. Yeah, so they work well. And do not let anything fall into the sinus. That is the number, number, number one most important thing. Do not let anything fall in. So let's say you have a perforation. What do you do? A, don't let anything fall in. Still finish your case because you you're already in there. You don't want to have to go back in again. So finish the case and then make that collar plug over there and make sure you get primary closure of the gingiva. So extra sutures, make sure nothing's pulling out. And then really as far as the post-op for the patient, they can't blow their nose. They have to use saline rinses and flonase for the next week just to make sure that they're not causing any trauma to the membrane itself. And then what happens if you get material in the sinus? You still got to finish the case and then you're going to have to refer to either your favorite ENT or oral surgeon. And I would recommend calling your malpractice because that could be a complicating factor. So, so do not so remember. Do you, when, you're, when you're resecting, mm -hmm. do you like shave down the root or do you still like go after three millimeter mark? Well, if you're doing... You can kind of shave down the root, and that way the suction and the water is just going to pull it out, and that's if the sinus membrane is still intact. If it isn't, you can. There is a way you can go in with that little blade sonic and cut at the three millimeter root, and then you can get in there with a. Um, what the hell's it called? Like a curette, and pop it off, and that way you don't have to worry. Well, holding on to it, that way you can pull it out without having it go into the sinus. But yeah, shaving it down totally works too. Any other questions about the sinus? Uh, once you have, like, if that exposure occurs early on, just while you're working in the crypt, will mm -hmm. you, what do you pack in that area to just Ca protect it? Call a plug if you can. So you do put it there right then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah and, and even if, if the... I've had a few where I know I'm right next to the sinus and I do the whole procedure and I haven't exposed it, I still pack it with a call a plug. It just makes me feel more comfortable so that nothing's going to get inside there. Okay. So then, yeah. would you would you take on a case that basically you know the lesion just erodes all that film yeah. above the sinus and it's just floating in the sinus? Yeah, because usually what's happening is that there's that much liquid, it has pushed the membrane up. It usually hasn't perforated into the sinus at that point, unless they're really sick, and they're usually going to be on antibiotics for the three days beforehand. So the pressure from that has decreased. And so sometimes you'll get inside there and you'll see there's like almost an empty space with a little bit of pus maybe still in there. And then the membrane is intact, but up higher. Cool. All right, let's talk about nerves. As far as nasopalatine, greater palatine, A, don't do palatal surgeries because they suck. Um, but the nasopalatine, the talking to the oral surgeon here, he does nasopalatine cyst removals all the time and for sure pulls out the nerve and it grows back and they're never numb. So it's like the one nerve that grows back. <laughs> so don't worry about the nerve on these, but do worry about the artery, especially the greater palatine. If you nick that artery, it pulls up and oftentimes you have to clamp on the outside, which is terrifying. So do not recommend that. Once again, don't do palatal surgeries because they suck. If it's the mental, um, what you want to do is map it out on the comb beam to know exactly where you need to go and measure. And I like to use perioprobes to get a rough idea where I need to go. And then you have a choice. You can either expose the nerve or not. And it really is going to be case dependent. The benefit of exposing it is you can see where it is. And what you can do is cut a slit for the Minnesota right above where the mental foramen is, and that's where the Minnesota goes, so that even as you're drilling, you'd have to cut through all that metal to get to the actual nerve. That's one way to manage it. Um, I recommend always giving steroids after just to limit that risk of having any paresthesias and let them know there's a risk. Um, intentional replants work extremely well in these cases, especially for premolars, because they usually come out pretty easily. Um, have you guys done intentional replants? No. 
If you get the chance to do one, if there's one that's like kind of close, you could do it Apico or Intentional, practice and do it in residency. It's a very nice tool to have in your back pocket. They're not that complicated. Um, the hardest part by far is the extraction because you have to be very gentle and not crush the PDL. <laughs> And then once it's loose, you get everything ready, and it takes like 45 seconds to do the entire Apico because you take a big high speed, cut it, prep it with the high speed, throw the MTA or BC in there, put it back in, and then you just put a little splint and you're done. It's very, very easy. Um, so Hold it for the four steps the whole time from yep. the ground. Yep. You don't want to touch the PDL. But thankfully, the 150s or 151s will work perfectly for that. So. And then as far as the IA, same as the, um, <laughs> I would recommend just giving up. I, I don't like doing molar surgeries. Um, the vast majority of them have failed. At that point, it's more predictable to do an implant anyway. But if you do want to do it, um, you can either do an intentional replant. I have done a couple of those or use the same considerations as the mental, but you really got to be careful with the IA because that's, that's a, that's a big one. So as far as what we use to fill, I like to use BC putty for mine. You can use MTA. You usually have to have a carrier system with that. I'll talk about that in a second. And we've also talked about retroplast. So for the apical fill portion, that's where I do use six handed dentistry because I need to have someone in there with suction so that there's no leakage of blood into the area. And then I need another person to hand me the instruments as well. So one is just on suction duty. The other is handing me instruments. And that's the only time where you really do need to have six handed dentistry. Uh, the rest of it, I use it for. Um, you can use carrier systems. Are you all familiar with the MAP system? Yes. Okay. I used it for years when I used uh, MTA and then I switched to BC. And you can almost shape it into a cone and just push it in. It works very well. Nice. You can also have disposable versions um, of the MAP system. Those are also nice. But the, with the MAP system, do be careful because the you do need to make sure they clear it after so that there's no material stuck inside there because each of those tips is very expensive. Uh, they do have to be replaced. But with most of the stuff we use now, I, I don't even own a map system because I don't, haven't used it. Grafting, is it necessary? Uh, have you guys done your surgery lit rotation yet? Have a rotation? All right, have you guys gone over surgery lit at all? Yeah. 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 Are they still saying as, as long as it's not a through and through, you don't need to graft? Uh, pretty much yeah. the indication was through and through, and if there's a marginal defect like associated. Okay, well, you guys know that. So um, the one thing is, as a owner, it is very exp It's about $100 for our cost per cubic uh, centimeter of bone. So it's not cheap at all to add on to there. And so you do have to pass that cost on to the patient. So I only do it in through and through cases at this point. Um, so you do have to charge them, like I said. But it does look really pretty. I'll show you guys one here in just a second. If you are into doing surgery, you can also use PRP or PRF. It works extremely well. I did a couple cases back with an oral surgeon that I worked with who would draw out blood for me and spin it, and it, the stuff is absolutely incredible. So I do like using that. This was a through and through case. Um, the palate approach wasn't really going to be an option for me. So here's what it looked like after the retreat and the retro prep. You can see that's actually a full CC of bone that I got in there, and it was still that large. Um, by the way, nine's still vital somehow. I don't know how, but nine's still vital. <laughs> so. So kind of this is what it looks like on the inside, big old hole inside there. Um, you can see just how massive that is. And that's what it looks like with a graft. And then you close it up and you're good to go. As far as suturing, a couple tips that I found that are very useful. If you're going to have that corner where you have your vertical, take tissue forceps, pull it up in that corner, and then take a two by two and hold heavy pressure, like hard, for about a minute. What that's going to do is start a fibrin clot. And if you've done it correctly, when you let go, the tissue should still be there. And then I like to do that corner with a single suture. I don't know if I talked about that or not. Yeah, yeah. So single suture in the corner that holds everything in place. And once that one's in there, you can just do the vertical and the horizontal and be done very quickly with just running locking or running sutures and be done. Um, works extremely well. And then the other cool thing I'll show you in a second. Jenny kind of came up with a uh, cool technique, one might say, where you take a two by two gauze, fold it up a few times, and then she pushes after each suture. I use a uh, 5 -oh, 6 -oh? I forget what I'm using right now, but really skinny, tiny sutures. And so they have a tendency to come undone. So while I'm holding it tight, she comes in and pushes on it, and it almost sets up a clot of blood on the actual suture itself, which is pretty cool. So that's kind of what it looks like in the corner. Just push there hard. You can see here Jenny has that two by two wrapped up on her gauze, and then I'm holding on to the sutures. These are the Castrojevos right here, and then my hand is holding this one as well. 
As far as finishing, rinse them, wipe them off, get them looking good, um, look for any signs of bleeding, and then just do single spot sutures on there if you need to. Uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, as far as the instructions, I put a damp 2x2 two two over it, instructions to change after 30 minutes just so that it absorbs any blood, but usually by this point you shouldn't have any blood if you've done this correctly. Um, that's kind of what it looks like. Ta-da. As far as what we do, um, chlorhexidine, I, I know it's controversial. I still do it. I'm not sure why. <laughs> this is the one thing where I was like, I don't know if I need to, but I've done it forever and it seems to make it work. But I know it can slow down wound healing, but it, I've also seen a lot of cases where they don't do a great job cleaning it and giving them the chlorhexidine will help clean it up a little bit faster. So I like to start them on the ibuprofen before they leave. We always use Marcaine in these cases, so they're numb for a while. Um, you guys have all seen the chart where it's like six hours, so... At noon, take ibuprofen. At 3, take Tylenol. At 6, take ibuprofen. Are you guys familiar with that? No? Maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just have that on your post-op sheet, and then the assistants can fill it out. It's a lot easier. Um, we do two ice packs, 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off, not to exceed four hours. Um, pretty straightforward there. And then make sure they know that if they're swollen after those four hours, you want to use heat. That's going to swell up the area, or it's going to open up the vessels and let everything that they, all the medications get inside there. Narcotics, I don't really use too much. Steroids, I use if I'm near the nerve, but really, not really necessary. So as far as follow-up, I usually see them a one week after for sutures. You can do it faster, but with these tiny sutures, it usually takes a little bit longer. Um, sometimes if they have a really thin biotype or on the elderly patients, you'll have to do two weeks. And then I check them at six months and yearly. And pretty much once once this is once it's healed up, your failure rate of apicos isn't. If you look at the you know the survival curve, there's a little dip at the beginning, and then it's pretty flat for the rest of time. So it, they're they're pretty, you know, you're gonna see some reliable apicos. So uh, quick thing on frenulum opacity. So have you guys ever done frenulum cut off frenums or anything like that? No. Okay, I'm going to show you the cheap and easy way that I learned from oral surgeons. You can do it with a really fancy laser, but I don't know how many of you will have lasers. So what you need is two straight hemostats. You come in one tight right along the maxilla like this, stretch the top lip up, and then the second one goes right on top of there from your vermilion border all the way to the vestibule. So it's going to look something like this. And so this right here is the fibrous tissue that you have to remove. It's very simple. You then take a 15 blade, slide it down here, slide it down here, and you get that big piece off. Once that is done, you then unclick one of them, and you can see exactly where the hemostats were grabbing. And it does a pretty good job actually stopping the bleeding. So you want to put a couple sutures in this area so that they can't reform. That's one of the main re reasons that um, frenulal opacities fail, is if you the tissue is able to touch each other, it's going to reform that fibrous bond. So you need something in there, and I use sutures so that it, they can't reform it. Looks something like this when it's all done. Usually you have to do about three or four, but single sutures right where the hemostats meet, and then up on the top, and you're usually good to go. Um, so that is a very easy process. Uh, it's it really is a very nice process and you can see this was a uh, one day post-op this is my assistant that I did it on um, and so it heals up very very quickly you will have to do some myofunctional therapy exercises to prevent the reformation of it but it really does improve smiles I know there's a big trend on TikTok going around right now talking about getting it done because it looks like lip filler like the, the before and after of people it literally looks like they got their lips filled out and all they had was a frenuloplasty so kind of looking at a difference here obviously they did the teeth as well if you look, at those margins, look at how much that has improved as far as her smile it will actually invert the lip a little bit more give you more of that plump look and it can help with gummy smiles so i really like it um, i do it more often than not and i do recommend it on if you're working on eight or nine and they do have a tight frenum do the frenuloplasty at the same time as the surgery because the risk of ripping out sutures is a lot higher i've seen that happen as well so that's it as far as surgery questions. Any questions on that? It's going to take a minute to load, so I'm going to let this start. Uh, when you are doing grafting, I'll screw it through. Yeah. Do you put the membrane on the palatal side? No. What you're just trying to do is get, um, you want to slow down the growth of the tissue. And so I haven't found it necessary as long as you're able to get really good closure. The, the soft tissue isn't going to be able to invade into the bone graft. You can yeah. do it where you just put membranes and not do a bone graft to try to save them some money, but what's the point of that is my thinking. And it makes the x-rays look pretty, so. <laughs> so you, you don't use a buccal membrane either? Nope. I know. It works. No. I, I, I've, I've yeah. 
yeah me know. membranes are you know it's you more need membranes when you're worried that there's going to be exposure to the oral environment and if i'm up against solid palatal tissue i'm not worried about it exposing there and as long as i can get good closure on the buckle i'm not worried about it there yeah i mean no. i feel like our non-rigid ones don't really do much anyway like, they, just, like, they like to flop, flop around and yeah. like around. yeah no 100 so, like, agree. What works has got to be like a rigid one you have to take that out yeah, and, and you can talk to Perio because what what a lot of that literature comes from is the implant grafting, and yeah. what they're trying to do there is grow volume. We're trying to keep it exactly the same. I just want here's the hole. I want to fill the hole. What they're trying to do is make it bigger, and when you make it yeah. bigger, you're going to stretch out the gum tissue to accommodate all that bone grafting material, and that's where you're going to need to have a membrane to cover over that so that it's not going to cause issues. Make sense? I have no idea why this is taking so long. Any other surgery questions? Cool. You, when you remove the sutures, when you place a graft? When do I move the sutures? Um, same time. As long as it's got primary closure, you're good. Most people heal pretty stinking quickly. <laughs> Most. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching that. Um, trying something new here with recording these presentations for the SLU residents. So if you have any questions, please drop them down in the comments below. Go ahead and subscribe. I have a few more presentations coming out, including one on how to start your own practice from scratch, which should be a real fun one. That one's uh, going to be a long one, but hopefully it will be useful information for you. As always, thanks so much.